last time I was before you, I uh, spoke on the topic, how to be heard in heaven. And today I want to speak to you on the topic, stepping out in fate. Why is it that we are often challenged when it comes to us not having enough faith to accept that God will indeed deliver us and to deliver on the promises that he would have made to us? Why is it so easy for us to believe that, that God is willing to act on the behalf of others? Why is it so easy for us to have a doubt about his willingness to act on our behalf? Why is it when trouble comes and adversity comes that we naturally assume the posture of fear and doubt and worry instead of wholeheartedly trusting God for deliverance through our trials and our difficulties? Why is it that we often try to figure things out and to solve the challenges and the problems by ourselves? When we do these things, we are living well below the privilege that we have as children of God and members of the household of faith. What will you have God do for you today? I'm sure all of us have some challenges and some issues in our lives. I'm sure all of us need God to do something for us. But so often we Try to, try to fight it on our own. We try not to, to bother God. But God is there for us. He wants us to knock on his door through prayers. He wants us to bother him. Do you have enough faith to truly and really to rely upon God to see you through? Today I want us to explore how we're going to step out on faith. How are we going to increase the level of faith that we have? And I want to tell you uh, something that happened when I was a child. It happened over and over when I was a child. When I was a child, my mom uh, she used to announce that we are going away. And if you're in the old days, that meant you're going to Miami. And I tell you when, when I heard that the, the, just the feelings of the euphoria that I experienced from my mother's words were indescribable. My, my thoughts would then immediately go to the long ride to the airport and in those days the airport seemed so far. You can remember those days? Yeah. But it seemed so far. In other words, my, my mind began to to envision us just walking into the airport, dragging those heavy suitcases and going either to BOAC at the time or Eastern Airlines. You all don't know about those airlines. And I could see myself and, and my family as we board the aircraft and the excitement that we had to, be, to go on the plane, as we would say. And as we would sit back and take that flight into Miami. When those words were spoken to me, it would have been as though I would have already been there. That simple utterance from that trusted voice had a profound effect upon me. She didn't show me any airline tickets or any other evidence of the trip, but I believed her nonetheless. She said it and I believe her. And because I believed it engendered in me this deep emotional sense of being emotional and excited. I had an unwavering trust in her because of my past experience with her. And I wholeheartedly believed that she would deliver upon what she would have promised. You see, I have had a past experience with her. She had previously promised that we were going away and she lived up to the promise and so I, she had a track record of reliability in this area. And so I have learned to trust her word entirely in matters like that. 
even though she provided no evidence of the trip. Even though it was not until a couple weeks later we would go. That did not dampen my excitement. That did not still my imagination. Her words stirred my excitement and emotions within me. In fact, I even bragged and told my friends that we're going away. I spoke it with confidence, without a shadow of doubt, with no hint of hesitation, because I regarded the one who made the promise as being faithful to her word. Y'all can relate to what I say. Y'all have had similar experiences. You see, I had faith in my mother. I know we know what faith is. Because we exercise faith a lot, you know. We exercise faith in the wrong direction, but we exercise it a lot. How many of us have gone into a restaurant for the very first time? or any business establishment, any establishment, and, and we pull out a chair and we sit, we sat down in the chair. We don't test the chair to see if it can take our weight. No, we give no thought to the matter. We simply sit down with the expectation that the chair will perform as it was designed to. We have faith in the chair and the maker or designer of the chair that it will perform. And it will do what it was uh, designed to do. How is it then that it comes to God and, and in the spiritual realm that there is a tendency for us to doubt, to fear, and to demonstrate weak faith or absolutely no faith at all? We need to feed our faith. We need to understand that faith is an essential element in the lives of the children of God. It's important for us to understand that we cannot even begin the process of beginning to try to please God if our faith is deficient or non-existent. The Hebrew writer tells us in Hebrews chapter 6, Hebrews chapter 11 and verse number 6 rather, he says, but without faith it is impossible to please him. But he who comes to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. We must believe that he is. Without faith, it is impossible to please him. And so how do we get faith? How do we step out in faith? How do we begin this process of firming our faith? In Romans chapter 10 and verse number 17, the scripture tells us, so then faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. Faith is in you if God's word is in you. But don't get me wrong, I'm not suggesting that if you are to memorize some passages of scripture, that's just memorizing passage of scripture solely that, that is sufficient to give us this great faith that we ought to have or we should be striving towards. Because it is indeed possible to memorize scriptures and still not have a great measure of faith. See, we're not talking about head knowledge. Instead, we're talking about heart knowledge. You see, it depends on whether or not you believe what you read. How much do you believe? How much do you trust God? When my mom spoke concerning the trip, I had it. Not a shadow of doubt. Not a hesitation. I acted like I was already there. The excitement was there. I had great faith in the relation in relation to that. But in relation to the things of God and, and the things that are going on in our life, how great is our faith? 
It's important for us to understand and appreciate. And I love this passage of scripture in 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse number 20. Because he tells us that all of the promises of God are yes. He's essentially telling us no matter how many the promises that of God, no matter how, how much promises God has made, God will deliver on each and every one of them. And so if God is willing to act in accordance with the promises that he would have made, why is it that we doubt? Why is it that we find it difficult to place our faith in God? But alas, was before you, I started to get into this Hebrews chapter 1 and verse number 11. He says, now faith is the substance of things, hope for the evidence of things not seen. We have faith when we are confident that what we had hoped for, that what we hope for, will actually happen. When I was advised that we were going away, I had great confidence. Nobody could have shaken that confidence. I had confidence that what I hoped for would indeed take place. That's right. Faith gives us the necessary assurances. Faith gives us the necessary conviction concerning the things that we hope for but we cannot see. I didn't see the aircraft. I didn't need to see it. I didn't see the ticket. I didn't need to see it. We didn't have to start parking. I didn't have to park. She said it and that settled it in my mind. We were gone. I had faith in what she said. And when you have faith, you have the substance of the things hoped for. That's why I got excited. That's why I had this unspeakable joy. Because I had the substance of the thing. I wasn't physically at the location I desired to be. But because she said we were going there, I trusted it. Notwithstanding the date has not arrived, it didn't matter to me. I know the date will come, although I couldn't wait till it come. When you have faith, you have the evidence of the things you do not yet see. You have the evidence of the things you do not yet see. I had faith. And the evidence of that faith was the excitement and the unspeakable joy that I had. No one could have told me that we was not going where she said we were going. Because I sincerely believed I had faith in her words. When you have faith, you have the proof that you possess the things you, not yet, you do not yet see. And just as I learned to take her at her word because of my experience with her, we must also learn to take God at his word because of our experience with him as revealing the scriptures. When we have faith, we speak in agreement with the word of God. Matthew chapter 12 and verse number 35 it says a good man out of the treasure of the heart bring it forth good things and an evil man out of the evil treasures bring it forth evil things the scripture calls us to speak words that are in agreement with God's word in Numbers chapter 13 God told Moses to send some men, some leaders among his people, to spy out the land of Canaan. And God specifically told them, I am going to give you this land. I'm going to give this land to the children of Israel. He didn't say, I was thinking, I'm thinking about giving you this land. 
He said, I am going to give you this land. Send some men there to spy out the land. To preview, get a preview of the land. So they could come back and tell the people how good this land is. And so God had promised to give the people the land. Remember the scripture says all the promises of God are yes. God promised to give them the land. It doesn't matter who in the land. It doesn't matter what armies in the land, what obstacles are in the land. God promised to give them the land so it doesn't matter what obstacles may be in the way. God knows how to move obstacles out of the way. And there came back the majority of them. And they brought back a report based on what they would have seen. All positive stuff. That's why God sent them there and let them see, look here, I ain't giving you no dry, dry up land. I give you a land that's prime real estate. They came back with base and they gave a report based on what they saw, what they felt, and what they heard. But they forgot that God had promised to give them the land. And their conclusion was, well, look at them people so big and strong. The land is so prosperous and stuff. I can't see them not giving up this land without a big time fight. And they said, man, we can't go take the land because nobody can, with sense can let anybody come and take the land from them. And so they brought what God calls an evil report because it contradicted what he had willed to happen. They felt that they could not possess the land notwithstanding the fact that God said that he would give them the land. And so anytime we speak Contrary to the word of God, we speak an evil report. And what you deposit in your heart will produce fruit in your life. If you deposit goodness in your heart, then goodness will come out. If it's evil, then evil will come out. And it usually comes out our mouth by what we say. One of the greatest enemies of our faith is fear. You see, these men went into the land and they saw the people that they were no slouches. And so they became afraid. Just as fate is powerful, fate is a powerful force, there is also a force that is opposed to fate and that force is called fear. In fact, we can rightly say that fear is the opposite of fate. And if we say, based on Hebrews, that faith is the substance of things hoped for or desired, then our fears are the substance of the things not desired. And when we fail, and when we fail greatly, we sometimes bring into manifestation the things, the very things that we fail and that we do not desire to happen. We believe in our fears. Sometimes we have they come become manifest in our lives. Job is an individual who fell into this category. In Job chapter three and verse number twenty-five. Job says, "For the thing I greatly feared has come upon me, and what I dreaded has happened to me." Job was an individual who was protected by God. Job had the best protection there is. There's no secret service detail as good as God's detail. In fact, the very accusation that Satan brought against God was concerning his handling of his servant Job. Satan said, you have hedged, said you've hedged him about on every side that I can't get to him. Job was well protected, but he didn't even recognize the protection that God had placed around him. He didn't understand or appreciate his secure state. And instead, he wasted his time fearing. And I want us to understand that God's, God's eyes is on us. And David tells us in Psalm 34, and verse number 15, he says that the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous and his ears are attentive to their cry. 
Many troubles will come, but God will deliver us from them all. Listen to me now. I said, many troubles will come. The trouble ain't the problem. And sometimes we get too busy focusing on the troubles. The, the Bible tells us that troubles will come, but it, we should know and we should be assured that God will deliver us from these troubles. In Psalms 19, verse number 34, it says, A righteous person may have many troubles, but the Lord delivers him from them all. It's a promise of God. Many troubles may come. But the Lord delivers him from them all. All of the promises of God in Christ are yes. He didn't promise not to give us troubles. He said, many may come. But be assured that when they do come, the Lord will deliver us from them all. When we grow in our fear, we nullify our fate. And this is what Job did. Job no doubt was a righteous man. Job no doubt was a man of fate. But Job had some challenges with his fate. When we have faith in the fate that God has prescribed for us, we can step out in fate. There's a story in Mark chapter 10 and verse number 46. The story of Jesus and a blind man, Bartimaeus. And in verse number 46 we are told says they came to Jericho and as he went out with his disciples and a great multitude, blind Bartimaeus, the son of Timaeus, sat by the road begging. And when he heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to cry out and says, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. And many warned him, be quiet. But he cried out all the more, son of David, have mercy on me. And so Jesus stood still and commanded him to be called. And they, and then they called the blind man saying to him, be of good cheer. Rise, he is calling you. Watch verse number 50. And throwing aside his garment, he rose and he came to Jesus. And Jesus answered and said to him, What do you want me to do for you? And the blind man said, Rabboni, that I may receive my sight. And Jesus said to him, Go your way. Your fate has made you well. And immediately he received his sight and followed Jesus on the road. So we have here, the scene is that Jesus was leaving Jericho. And as he walked by this blind man, Bartimaeus, Bartimaeus would have heard that Jesus was in the area and that Jesus was passing by. And as a result, he called out to Jesus. It wasn't just any ordinary call. It says, Jesus, son of David, that meant something to Jesus. Have mercy on me. You see, by calling Jesus the son of David, he was affirming his belief that Jesus was the Messiah. That Jesus was no ordinary prophet, no ordinary man. That there was something to Jesus. The people around him, so much like the people around us, they tried to quiet him and still his fate. That's right. Boy, shut up, man. Let nobody check him for you. But he would not allow them to stop his mouth. He would not allow them to quench his fate. In fact, the more they turned to be quiet, the more he began to make more noise. And he kept calling out louder and louder, and he was persistent in his call. And again, this is further proof of his fate. He knew that Jesus could do something for him. And so he was not going to allow anyone to stop him from calling on the one who could help him. He didn't care what they think about him. If they were calling him undignified, they were calling him loud and boisterous, 
They were calling him disorderly. He didn't care. He had one focus. He wanted something from Jesus. And he showed that he believed in Jesus. He had faith in Jesus because of his persistence. And he also believed that Jesus would be willing to act on his behalf. Why did he believe that Jesus would act on his behalf? And there were so many other people. I'm sure he was not the only blind man around Jesus that day. I'm sure he was not the only one that was uh, infirm or sick. But he believed that Jesus would hear him. He believed that Jesus would act on his behalf. And just as his faith told him, Jesus responded. Jesus heard his cry just as he would hear our cries. And he stopped and he called that, that the blind man, and he asked that the blind man come to him. And again, verse number 50, we always miss this in verse number 50. Throwing aside his garment, he rose and he came to Jesus. On the surface, this may seem like a simple thing. But scholars tell us that the coat of a beggar was a, the, perhaps the most valuable thing that they possessed. That coat could be his shelter from the weather. That coat would kept him warm. Yeah, it was his house. He could ball up in a corner and just throw that coat and cover himself. They also say that that coat was a special coat that was issued by the government. Now, this is what the scholars say, based on the history. And they say that the wearer of a coat like the one perhaps that he had, had the right legally to collect arms or to beg arms. He was identified by his coat. So it was not just any old coat. You see, when he discarded that coat, and he got up and moved towards Jesus, he made a statement that Jesus saw. He was boldly declaring that the life that he used to live was not the life that he was going to return back to. Yes, he rose up a beggar and blind. But he wouldn't need that coat anymore, so he cast off that coat. His most valuable possession. Because he knew that he was going to one who would give him something even more valuable. Someone that would change his life. One that will heal his blindness. You see, he had faith that Jesus will do for him what no other man could do. That is, restore his sight. He understood that he would no longer be dependent upon that coat. His ark was an ark of faith. His simply getting up, casting off the coat, and stepping forth to Jesus was an ark of faith. And when he stood before Jesus, Jesus asks a blind man, what do you want me to do for you? It should be obvious, but Jesus wanted him to declare what he wants. And all of us got all kinds of issues going on in, in our lives and in our bodies and stuff. And we live well below the privilege that we have. You know, my daughter said to me uh, yesterday evening, you know, I have headaches from time to time sometimes. She says, Daddy, look at you got more faith than the, in the pills than in God. And I initially said no. Then I said, yeah, you're right, you know. This beggar could have asked, when Jesus asked him, what do you want me to do for you? This beggar could have asked for money. I mean, he was a beggar. Most beggars ask for money. He could ask for food. But you see, his faith was much bigger than that. It was easy for him just to ask Jesus, you know, give me something to buy, give me a dollar to buy, something to eat. Or give me some food. You know, well, I ain't going to try to test you, Jesus, and ask you to do something that you may not be able to do. His faith was bigger than that. This man wanted to see, so he told Jesus what he wanted from him. He 
Jesus as I was seen. Jesus asks, and he told him. And Jesus simply said to him, Go, your faith has healed you. Go, your faith has healed you. And the text tells us that blind Bartimaeus instantly recovered his sight and followed Jesus. By saying, Your faith have made you well, Jesus was emphasizing the necessity of faith that this man had, the faith that he had. He had a kind of faith that was pleasing to God. He had a faith that was willing to step out in spite of the odds. He had a faith that was willing to step out despite the opposition and the naysayers. He had a faith that, and a boldness that was willing to declare what he wanted, notwithstanding People may look at him and say, well, you fool, asking God, Jesus, for, for sight. Why are you just asking to give you a new coat or give you the food, give you the water, or whatever you needed? But he wanted his sight. Blind man, I mean, understood the truth and he earnestly sought the Lord. And his action reflected the kind of faith that he had, a faith that was well pleasing to God. What about you? When you throw off your outer garment of self-reliance and independence, when you throw off that coat of fear and worry and doubt, and when you come and you bring your request before God, notwithstanding what it is, be bold as this man was bold. Ain't nothing that is impossible for God. No man could have given him back his sight. If it was possible, perhaps he would have had it. What is the desire of your heart? What will you have God do for you? you no, know, according to Matthew chapter 19 and verse number 26. With God, all things are possible. And we have the possible sitting in our midst. Man may write you off. Family may write you off. But with God, with faith in God, you are not written off. God is a God can do, that can do the impossible. God can work it out. God's word, the scriptures are filled of his promises. We need not fear because Isaiah tells us the promise of God concerning this is fear not for I am with you. Be not dismayed for I am your God. I will strengthen you. I will help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. That's a promise from God. God promised that if we trust and depend on him solely, that we don't have to try to figure it out. He says, he will. Proverbs chapter 3, verse number 5 says, Trust in the Lord with all your heart and do not lean on your own understanding. Jeremiah tells us that God has some plans for us. In Jeremiah chapter 29, verse number 11 says, For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans for your welfare, not for evil. To give you a future and a hope. God is on your side. And if God is on your side, what can man do to you? Even those who plot against you and hate against you, they can't do nothing to you. The psalmist tells us in Psalms 118, verses 6 through 9, says the Lord is on my side I will not fear what can man do to me he says the Lord is on my side as my helper I shall look and triumph on those who hate me it is better to take refuge in the Lord than to trust in man it is better to take refuge in the Lord than to trust in princes we encourage to cast all of our cares all of our worries, anxieties, and concerns onto God. That means to push them off onto God. First Peter chapter 5 and verse number 7 says, Casting all your anxieties on Him. Why? Because He cares for you. Believe that you can do all things through Christ. Philippians chapter 4, verse number 13. I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. 
Not that I can do all things in and of my, myself, but I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. So cast off your outer garments. Step out in faith. Have faith in your faith. Those are my words of encouragement to you today. If you require prayers, come forward. God is still ready, ready, willing, and able to deal with any situation you got. I, I, I would like to challenge anybody who got any situation they feel that like God can't deal with. Give him a chance. Throw on God. He will show you what time it is. Those are my words of encouragement. Would you stand?